Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here, and this video is a video that I'm typically not used to making in terms of style. I think I've only ever done a top 10 on my channel once before, and that was like the top 10 decks before ABC was released back in fall of 2016. So it's definitely something I'm not used to doing on my channel. I don't do top 5s or top 10s nearly as often as I probably should in terms of channel growth, but if you guys like this sort of thing, then definitely let me know in the comments down below. But this video is spawned by somebody who sent me a Facebook message, and they asked me what my favorite OCG exclusives were, and which ones do I think I would want to be imported into the TCG if I could choose. And so, I already had a basic idea of what list I would put together, and all the cards that are on the list I'm about to present to you are cards that I did know about beforehand, but I had some time on my hands, so I started doing some research, and because I did this research, I actually just did not understand that we had 310 OCG exclusives that we do not have in the TCG. So I started looking through all of them. Now, a lot of them are a lot of vanilla monsters that don't really have any sort of impact, but there are actually some legitimately good cards there, outside of the ones I'm about to list. But anyway, I did the research into making this into some sort of structured format, so I figured I might as well make a video. And again, if you guys like this, then definitely let me know. And if you have any other topics for other top fives or top tens you might want me to do, then definitely let me know in the comments down below or message me through Facebook if you're interested in getting me to do something like that. But other than that, let's get straight into this top five list of the OCG exclusives that I wish that we had in the TCG and that I'm kind of upset that we don't have for various reasons. Now, this list will be going from number five to number one, and the number five slot is going to be stuff that is basically not meta-relevant or meta-defining, and it will be working its way up to potential rogue status cards, and then eventually it will get to the number one slot, which is a card that I'm furious that we don't actually have, by the way. I'm so angry that we got a card like Scramble Egg in our Extreme Force imports when we could have gotten a card like in the number one slot that would have actually been a hugely meta-defining card in terms of what it could allow for decks right now as well as decks in the potential future of this game. But anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump straight into number five on this list. Number five on this list is Junk Collector. This is a card that I just have this guilty personal pleasure of wanting. Uh, I want it for various reasons. One, Yusei was my favorite anime protagonist, and I collect Yusei cards. Like, I've got a binder literally across the room that I'm looking at right now that has nothing but junk cards, quick draw cards, Stardust Dragons, and stuff in. And basically, it's just a little Yusei collection, because Yusei was my favorite anime protagonist. 5Ds was my favorite series, and Yusei was my favorite of the U-Boys, essentially, you could call them of the main character, main protagonists of any of the Yu-Gi-Oh! series. And so, Junk Collector never coming to the TCG means that I can't collect this card, so I can't be collecting junk by collecting junk collectors, which is kind of punny. Uh, but basically, this card was released eight plus years ago in Japan in like the Yusei Dual Disc thing as a, uh, as a product pack that came with the toy Dual Disc. Uh, and we just never got it in the TCG, and there was plenty of opportunities for it to get imported as well, because we had multiple Duelist Pack Yuseis, we had multiple tins that were Yusei themed, but we just never got this card, and I never quite understood why. It doesn't really do anything either, in terms of being meta-relevant. It did help fuel some FTKs for a brief period of time in the OCG by doing things like copying Magical Explosion, but those were never super relevant, and then it got dealt with rather quickly, um, even though it wasn't that relevant at all, but it's just a card that I want for personal reasons, because it's the Junk Collector, it's a Yusei card, and, like, I mean, there are other people besides me that collect Yusei cards as well, I mean, hell. Uh, but, so, like, this is just a card that I want for personal reasons, for fan servicey reasons, uh, because it's literally, like, the only, one of the only cards that's omitted from any form of collection if you are collecting cards in the way that I am doing that, but... That's basically the only reason for this card is for fan servicey reasons. There's there's nothing else for it. So, moving on to number four. This is again another sort of fan servicey thing, but it's more of just like it's just a thing that it's a deck that people always like universally people know about this deck no matter how long they've been playing Yu-Gi-Oh for. They've almost always heard about it, and it's just it's kind of upsetting that this is the only set of support from Secrets of Eternity that we never got in terms of OCG exclusives. And that, of course, is Crystal Vanguard and Crystal Protector. Now, I know this is two cards facilitating one slot on this list, but they are essentially, you know, they facilitate the same role. They are the pendulum cards that go into the Crystal Beast deck. I don't really care too much about Over the Rainbow or Crystal Horde, which were the other two cards that were introduced as Crystal Beast Legacy support in Secrets of Eternity alongside these two cards, although those are also OCG exclusives. 
In fact, we've gotten all of the OCG exclusives from Secrets of Eternity, the Train exclusives and the Symphonic Warrior exclusives, which were guitar and mics, and we've gotten those. These are the only cards, the Crystal Beast cards are the only ones that we never got from Secrets of Eternity, and that's tragic for multiple reasons, and that's why I want them, is because like Crystal Beast is, an, is, is a deck that's just really pretty, it's really expensive for no reason as well, it has a lot of collector value, but it's really unfortunate that this deck got Pendulum Monster support. That's not actually bad. It wouldn't make the deck top tier shit or anything, but it still gives the deck a bit of a bigger card pool and it's a bit better of a deck in general. But we never got these Pendulum cards before the Pendulum rule set changed for Master Rule 4. So we could never ever play with these cards in any sort of Pendulum based deck to try and make Crystal Beasts as good as possible via Pendulum Summoning. Ever. We can never try that. We can never try to just make, you know, good Crystal Beast decks with Pendulum mechanic, you know, influence. We can not do that now. And that actually just really, really frustrates me because these cards are very well designed. Like I said, they wouldn't be very meta relevant. They wouldn't be very competitively defining in terms of having impact. But they're just two very solid cards that fixed a lot of issues that Crystal Beasts did have. And even though it never did anything in the OCG and it would do nothing in the TCG either, I just find it ridiculous that it has been legitimately four years since these cards came out in the OCG and we have not heard anything in terms of them getting imported to us. And there's already another wave of Crystal Beast Legacy support that the OCG just got that we might not even see in the future either because if we saw that then we would see these. We would have seen these before we saw that. It's just it's one of those things that actually just upsets me in terms of the import process. That's purely why these two cards are on this list is because I liked the anime. Johan or Jesse if you watched the dub is one of, you know, the cooler characters in terms of the show, in terms of what he went through, what he stood for, all that sort of stuff, like how he introduced himself into the show and made a large impact and was a major player in the short amount of time that he was in the show. Even if you're unfamiliar with the show, like, it's one of those archetypes that you've heard about. No matter, like I said, no matter how long you've been playing this game, chances are you've heard about Crystal Beasts and you've looked at their artwork and admired how at least pretty the cards look. Um, but like, we just never got these cards, and we now can't try to use them under previous Pendulum format rule sets, and that's that's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate, and it makes me it makes me kind of upset. <laughs> it's it's again more of a fan servicey reason why I want these cards, but it makes me upset that we had literally zero way to try and make this deck have any potential with these new cards because of how the import system works but next card on the list at the third slot is the cards that we start getting into that could actually have competitive impact and that is fright for patchwork now this card hasn't been out for that long of a time in the ocg i think it's been out for around a year or so at this point i think it was released in november of 2016 so i guess it's actually no yeah that's that's a little bit over a year um a little bit over a year since this card was released uh, it was released sometime around early fall to late fall 2016 in Japan. And it's a very simple card. It's like a pre-preparation of rights for Fright Furs and for Fluffles. Uh, and it's just a, it's a card that people who like the Fluffle and Fright Fur archetype really want. And this card is actually powerful enough to probably make that deck into a better rogue contender. Because even under Master Rule 4, that deck can play rather efficiently and rather well. And... While I don't really have any sort of intense desire to play Frightfurs or Fluffles, I'm not a big fan of, like, the deck in terms of its design. Again, being someone who watches all the anime series, I do have, you know, information and, you know, exposure to it from the anime. Sora was a kind of alright character that I can kind of get behind for fan servicey reasons. But Frightfurs and Fluffles as a deck actually kind of intrigues me in the essence of how it was designed to try and make a fusion archetype as good as it can be without being very lazy with card design. You can compare Fluffles to a deck like Shadal's that also came out during the Arc 5 era, and Shadal's was just obvious very lazy card design. Every single main deck monster has two effects, one on field and one when it's sent to grave for effect via fusion summon or just regular effect. Shadal fusion is polymerization, but you know what, let's make it fuse from the deck. 
we got the quick play poly, and then all of the extra deck monsters are forms of removal or soft locks in some form or function that are all just incredibly generic. Shadal's had incredibly generic and very, like, lazy card design, and they were a very good fusion deck because of that. But then you look at Frightfurs, which were also a decent fusion archetype that were released during the Arc 5 era, and they're completely different in terms of the scope of their design. And that's not to say that Fluffles have bad cards. Like, the Fluffle Frightfur deck has some of the most insane cards that I've ever read that are all congested into one archetype. Like, they've got Stratos, they've got Monster Reborn, they've got a card that adds back Poly when fused with, they've got a card that adds back Monsters when they're fused with. They have so many different cards that are actually just really good, but they're missing that one card that pushes them over the edge, and Patchwork is kind of that card. So it's like, it's two completely different approaches to the way to handle a fusion archetype between Shadals and between Fluffles, where it's a bunch of an amalgamation of retrains of other effects, and it all comes together to work very, you know, decently. And that's something that I respect about the archetype. While I may not like the archetype that much, I can respect its design, and that's basically why I would like to have a card like Patchwork imported to us. Give the Fluffle fans something to at least try to play. This deck would probably be something that you could actually lose to on the regional circuit. Would it top a YCS level event? Probably not. The deck has some other glaring problems that has to be solved, especially under Master Rule 4, but Patchwork is a card that we shouldn't necessarily have to be waiting on cards like this to be imported for fans of decks to actually have chances to play them. And that also transitions into the next card that I'm going to be talking about, which is number two on the list, DDD Flame High King Genghis. This card, this card is actually a card that would also potentially have some form of competitive impact if it was imported, because DDDs are not a weak deck by any stretch of the imagination. They do get hindered by Master Rule 4, although some Link monsters attempt to address this. The biggest issue that the deck has is that because you have to commit to Link summoning at least once now, you end up losing a couple of resources into making your big boards, and you don't have enough extra deck dudes that can special summon stuff back to recoup resources as, you know, needed. Like, you don't have as many as needed to actually facilitate a large, impactful first turn board as nearly as well as we did before Master Rule 4, where you could just go Omega Siegfried Crystal Wing without having to worry about Link Monsters. But so, DDD Flame High King Genghis kind of helps solve this because it's the right level, being a level 8, meaning you can combine it with Ragnarok or Thomas into something like Titanic Galaxy or just another rank 8, and it also is just another fusion monster that allows you to bring back stuff from your grave while you're comboing off, and that's huge. That one card makes such a big difference in terms of combo potential for the DDD deck. And we don't have this card, and I have no idea why. For some reason, DDD is always getting the DD dick in terms of when cards get imported to it. Like, DDD got its structure deck incredibly late in the game and never really got a time to shine. It was the best deck for exactly zero YCSs because it was released at the beginning of 2017 in January and then Raging Tempest came around the corner two and a half weeks later to introduce Zodiacs to us to make, like, DDD irrelevant. But basically, we're always getting the fusion monsters late. And I have no idea why that is. Like, the good fusion monsters. Like, we got DDD Flame King Genghis incredibly late. And we don't have DDD Flame High King Genghis. But we also don't have DDD uh, Super Doom Purplish Armageddon. Meanwhile, I don't even know if anyone even understands or acknowledges the fact that we have DDD Super Doom King Bright Armageddon and Super Doom King Dark Armageddon. And those were imported to us in Battle of Legends Light's Revenge. Like... Nobody actually knows that those cards are illegal <laughs> and have a TCG printing, but the only cards that we don't have are the fusions. We have DDD Gust High King Alexander and DDD Wave High King Caesar. Those are the cards that are counterparts to High King Genghis, but those cards came out in Code of the Duelist as rares, but we do not have High King Genghis. And then Super Doom King Bright and Dark Armageddon got imported in Battle of Legend Light's Revenge, but we don't have the Fusion Armageddon card. We don't have Super Doom King Purplish Armageddon. We're always just getting dicked over on the Fusion monsters in terms of DDD's imports, and that's kind of upsetting, because DDD is a deck that I actually do really enjoy in terms of it's a very high-ceiling, high-technical-play deck 
that takes a lot of actual resources invested into plays, but you combo off with those resources incredibly well, and that gets you into your ending boards. Uh, so it's a deck that I would like to see have a card like High Flame King Genghis to at least try to play at full capacity while trying to, you know, combat the restrictions placed on it through Master Rule 4. It would be incredibly interesting to me to see that happen, but anyway, first card on the list, number one. The number one slot is a card that, like I said, I am absolutely furious that we do not have because this card would do so much to define the metagame right now as we stand currently in February 2018, and that is Odd Eyes Revolution Dragon. Now, this card does a huge amount of stuff for both Pendulum decks and for just random decks in general because it also just is ca casually a random extender for dragons. If you don't know what this guy's effect is, you definitely should go look him up and read him because he's actually just super well-rounded in terms of what he allows you to do for Pendulum decks and then is super well-rounded for what he allows him to be as an extender for just other dragon decks that can summon any Xyz, Synchro, or Fusion monster. Its Pendulum effect is a fantastic extender for combos because all you do is put it in your Pendulum scale, destroy it, and summon one Dragon-type Fusion, Synchro, or Xyz monster from your graveyard. That's all you do. So this is a fantastic extender for those types of decks. Like, you could play this in Blue Eyes, you could play this in Dragoonity, you could play this in so many decks that have access to large quantities of dragon cards that it summons from the extra deck and you could just play this it all it is is monster reborn it's not even a hard once per turn so that's fantastic but the main reason i want this card especially after the most recent ban list that we have in the tcg and how it affected pendulums is that this card allows you to discard it pay 500 life and then add a level eight or lower dragon pendulum monster from your deck to your hand so, the main thing that does is that makes the Supreme King Dark Worm package a lot more consistent in terms of what it allows you to do in Pendulum decks. There's definitely a reason why the OCG is playing three of this and three Dark Worm in a lot of their Pendulum Magician variants, because it's a consistency enabler. It allows you to go into certain play lines, and it would make the deck as a whole a lot more consistent. And it just, it, it's one of the cards that, like, this card has a place in the future of the game as long as there are ways to get to Dragon Pendulum Monsters, or as long as there's a deck that's decent enough at summoning Dragon-type monsters from the extra deck, that it can be used as an extender. Like, this is my favorite OCG exclusive by far, by a large margin, because I could play this in the best deck of the format right now, or I could play it in Dragoonities and use it as a combo extender in some random, you know, situation where I want to bring back Gaydurg like seven times a turn. It's definitely one of those cards that I am really, really upset that we don't have. But anyway, this list actually got really long in terms of how long I spent discussing each individual card or slot rather, since one slot had two cards in it, but let me know your opinions on this list in the comments down below. Let me know if you're interested in this kind of thing, if you have any other suggestions, if you want me to do more top five or top ten type lists, leave them in the comments down below, or message me them to me through my Facebook fan page, which the link for is in the description down below. But other than that, as always guys, thanks for watching, like, comment, subscribe to all the nonsense you usually do. Like I've said, check out the links in the description to connect with me through other forms of social media, or if you want to follow me on Twitch or whatever for when I do live streams, all that sort of stuff. But as I've already said, thanks for watching. Thanks for your time as usual, guys, and take care. I'll see you in the next video. But now that the video's over, I'd like to give special thanks to my patrons, Iradium, Yuki Phoenix, Troy Perkins, Eric Gertsen, Tour Guides Guy, and Ringleader, as well as everybody else supporting in the lower tiers. You guys help make what I'm doing here continue to be possible. You have my eternal gratitude, as always, and you're forever awesome. Thank you so much for the support, you guys.